What do you know about Jehovah's Witnesses? It's a great question. I actually had to think about it when you asked. Um, I have one distinct memory. I was probably nine or ten, and I grew up in a small town in Jasper, and Jehovah Witness knocked on our door. Um, and my mom kind of got into a panicky mode, and I obviously didn't know at the time what it was. And it only happened once, and they knocked, and I don't even remember what the conversation one was, but I remember that my mom was trying to keep it quick, and going back inside, and that was it. And now I'm 24, and I feel like, if I'm being honest, I've had such little to no interactions with Jehovah Witnesses, as far as I know up to this point in my adult life. Yeah, so I was I was brought up with the belief that um, they they follow the same similar doctrine to to Christianity. <laughs> For me honestly, it's judgment. And and that they're not I don't see I don't see when I think about it, I don't see love, I don't see openness, I don't see Jesus, because Jesus is love, he is hope, um, and he's the opposite of shame and judgment. So that's what I see when I think of Jehovah's Witnesses that are in with, the, with what they believe. Yeah, I, I can't say I know too much. My experience has been getting handed pamphlets, talking to them, having some pretty um, vigorous conversations, obviously, as a, as a pastor and as a um, follower of Christ, with them about different different ideas. But as far as the inner workings and things like that, I, I don't really know too much. I'm just starting to learn some things. Okay, so I was born in August of 1979. Uh, my parents had converted to BEJWs in the spring of 1976. Um, my family was a very devout JWs. Like, uh, we had a, a really good upbringing. My parents were very loving. Um, my dad served as an elder almost the entire time growing up. He stepped down a couple of times, mostly because of me. <laughs> the trouble I was getting into, but um, they were very um, devout. I was, you know, found a study on Monday. Uh, Tuesday was the theocratic ministry school. Thursday was the book study. Sunday, the meeting was um, week after week after week. Uh, in 1988 and 89, my parents sold everything and moved to Dominican Republic to help out where the need was greater. Um, they there for that year, and then... Uh, we moved back to Canada, and uh, we lived in Prince George for a bit, and then um, back to, to Quinell, BC. Um, it was very, uh, very good. I, I thought, like, my impression of the religion was there was no, like, abuse. My dad was very loving towards my mother, and my mother was very res respectful to my dad. Um, so my, it was almost the perfect storm for... Uh, you know, believing it to be the truth because my perception of it was good. Like there was no negativity. And, uh, but I was also, you know, like I didn't take it seriously as a child. Like I got into all, you know, all sorts of trouble and stuff. And 
I didn't view the Bible characters as real people. They were more like, you know, Mickey Mouse or Indiana Jones. They weren't like real people to me. Um, <laughs> I would say that my studies, you know, having to be serious and routine with it. Um, I ended up getting disfellowshipped at 18 um, for getting in trouble with my, my boyfriend at the time. Um, <clears throat> that's when I met and married my husband, Scott, and uh, he has never been a JW. Um, <clears throat> I got reinstated when I was 19, so I was out for 11 months. And um, I got reinstated so I could see my family again. I was missing them in the association. I still didn't um, place an importance on the religion itself. And uh, we moved here to Alberta in 2002. Um, I was going to being very sp sporadic with meetings. Like it w was away from the comfy setting of, you know, you knowing people and everything. And you're, these are all strangers to me and everything. And um, then my dad died in 2004 in the spring. And he was um, like the first person that I had lost in death. And so it was sort of earth, earth shattering. And I really began to question life and um, what I wanted to do with my life. And um, I think that that's right when that summer after he died, they had a talk at the convention. It was called Just Keep Walking. And uh, it just like struck a chord because <clears throat> Because he described it as, you know, being in the truth as very loving, and it was like. <clears throat> Growing up, it was uh, cozy. You know, it was very getting together with friends with dinners and um, playing soccer and stuff after Sunday meetings and. It was a very uh, close-knit community, I guess you could say. And um, <laughs> although it was like, I don't know, it felt sort of torturous as a kid, right? Going and doing all these things for the, the um, religion itself. But I think what got me was the memories of the people, right? And so um, I really began to question life and what I wanted to do with it. And so I started to... Um, well, actually, I approached one of the sisters in my hall. I asked her if she would study with me because um, I wanted to, to pursue it, like to actually really pursue it. And so we started studying and I was really reading the Bible on my own um, outside of the actual study that we were doing each week and, and outside of the meetings. I was actually just trying to read the Bible from front to back. And to know what was in there because I never had before. And um, it started, um, like, I don't, know, I don't know how to explain it. Like, it's like it starts to feel like it's like really speaking to you as a person. And especially like in the New Testament side of it. Um, and especially when you get to like the books like in Romans and things. It's like it starts to feel like it was written specifically for you. Like you are part of what they're talking about. And so... <clears throat> And any time the every time the memorial would come around, that feeling would get stronger. Like I'm supposed to be, like partaking of it, because that's um, as Christians, that's what you're supposed to do, right? And um, and so, but I argued with myself because who am I, right? Like here, I'm married to someone who isn't a witness. Um, I've, you know, I've been to all, into all sorts of trouble as a youth, and and um, but like basically, I hadn't earned it. I guess is what I'm trying to say. And so. But I tried talking about it with uh, one, my mom one day over um, Skype and uh, was trying to explain to her these, these feelings that I was having. And she, you know, she's under the indoctrination of the Watchtower. So she's starting to ask you if you know, you think maybe you're just getting a little bit too emotional in this. Or, you know, she's wanting me to like really question myself, right? And I, I understand why she was doing that, but uh, it made me feel like I was well, maybe I am crazy, you know, like, and so I stopped reading the Bible at that point. Like I had every day I'd been reading it up from 2005 to 10. And <clears throat> so, excuse me, I stopped doing that. And then, um, 
I would say like I, I, I still believed in it, like really believed in it. So I was trying to get to meetings and conventions and, and um, you know, teach the kids. But it was a struggle because you're, it's just me doing it. My husband isn't a believer, although he's supported it, he always has. And um, it began, began to feel really like um, tiring because here I'm, I work full time as well. So it's like you're trying to juggle full time. You know, with house chores and kids and everything, that's just like a really a lot. And uh, um, and then I just started to just see like it's not like like in my congregation, it was not like how it was growing up. It wasn't like I was being included in things. Like I would reach out to sisters in the hall, like especially sisters who had you know were single, like they didn't have a, a spouse, right? That was uh, to support them. And I didn't feel like I was getting the reception back. Like I'd reach out, but then nothing would happen with it or. It was very rare that we would, me and the kids would be invited to things. Like on the odd occasion we would, but it was like you weren't, um, you didn't really know what was going on in the congregation. Like you'd, now and again you'd hear things and then you'd be shocked. But you didn't find out like months, you know, previously. And, um, but I was still holding on to the fact that like this, I believed it. I believed the doctrine. I never doubted it at all. Um, and then um, in 2000 and... Let's see, 2016, my cousin uh, passed away. So that sent me on a little bit of an emotional tailspin. And then um, my son had stopped all of a sudden coming to meetings. And that was terrifying as a mother because you think your child's going to be destroyed with Armageddon now because, you know, you don't, they're not coming, they're not active, right? They're not going to be saved, I guess, when it comes or whatever. So um, I was a little bit emotionally, you know, bothered by that and then um but then we went to the convention for the stay loyal to jehovah i think it was called in 2016 we got you know you go there and you get your what is the dose of indoctrination right it basically is what it is um and it came away away from it with the second wind of like no i'm going to get back into it i'm going to be you know um get strong in it again and feel good and it'll all turn out or whatever and then um I had a dream in, uh, I would say September or October. It was like a day like today. I was standing on my stove there cooking and I um, was home alone. And I felt like someone was behind me. So I turned around and it was my dead JW dad and my dead JW cousin who died in the spring. And um, I said to them, what are you doing here? And they're like, well, we've been resurrected. And I was like, that is impossible because it doesn't, great, the Great Tribulation in Armageddon hasn't happened yet. And um, they're like, well, we have been. You just can't tell anyone yet. And I was like, I don't have to tell anyone. They, they'll see you. Just like, I'll see you now. And then I woke up from the dream. I was sort of creeped out because it was like very real. And, um, and then that show, Scientology in the Aftermath, the first season started. And I was really interested in watching that because I was always wondered what Scientology is. I thought it was a Christian religion because the symbol looks very much like a cross. And... Um, so I thought I was going to be learning about, the, I guess, the doctrine of, uh, and I was thinking you'd be able to use that in service if you ever run into a Scientologist, you know, have some sort of footing to stand on. And um, so I start watching this and then I'm seeing like the similarities of, you know, discouraging higher education and um, shunning former members, not uh, looking at negative media about the group, um, weird medical practices, and... Um, just very theocratic, no, what was it called? Um, oh shoot, I can't remember. Fair game, right? So it's like theocratic warfare with the witnesses, right? And so um, the show, the very last uh, episode of the show is showing the actual real history of Hubbard and who he was. And um, it was horrifying to find out like he'd lied about everything about himself and, and was destroying like thousands of families for nothing, just for purely for control and uh, and money, <laughs> essentially by that religion too. And so um, the show ended and then uh, I was at work um, and I drive transit for uh, Shore Park. And um, I was doing a run to the university, and at the time we were driving coach buses. So it's like the Greyhound um, buses, and so like people are sitting like right next to you. So just the one lady gets on, and she sits like right, almost right behind me, but just over. And um, 
so we're just making chit chat or whatever. And so I asked her how, how her holidays went because it was the week after Christmas. And uh, so she was telling me and so then she asks me how mine went. And I, so I said to her, actually, I'm one of those witnesses. I don't celebrate the holidays. And, but I was trying to like be positive, like, you know, it was nice to have time off or whatever, be with family and stuff. And uh, she's like, oh, I used to be a Jehovah's Witness. I was raised in it. My mom still is. I uh, left as a teenager. And so she started giving me a little bit of her story. And then um, we got to the transit center. And just as she's getting off, she asked if I had heard about the Australian Royal Commission's investigation into Jehovah's Witnesses. And I obviously I hadn't. <laughs> and uh, so I said, no. And she's like, yeah, they found like a thousand and six pedophiles that the organization knew about, but that they reported zero of them to the authorities. And I was, I was going to argue with her at work, right? I don't want to make a leave a bad impression or anything. So she got off my bus and, uh, so I drove around ticked off and saying, be spreading lies about God's organization and this and that. And, um, but because I had just finished the show, mind control, which is essentially what that show was. It was not, you're not learning about the religion. You're learning about how mind control works. And I didn't even know that was a thing. I thought mind control was brainwashing where you're like kidnapped and beaten into believing a certain religion. And it's not, it's where you start associating with the group because you like its morals or its principles. And they slowly take you away from your, your family if, if they're not believers. Right. And so, um, so I Googled it. I Googled those words, Jehovah's Witnesses, Australian Royal Commission, 1006, and it brought me like right to the government website, which proved that it, like it was true. It's not apostate lies, like the organization likes to say. It's actual fact. And um, on the options was like video, and so I clicked on the video thing, and it brought up the footage of the actual court case and Jeffrey Jackson on the stand there, and he's like saying all these lies, like that. Or what I appeared, you know, appeared to me as a Jehovah's Witness to be a lie, because they say that they're at the meeting. You hear that they're God's only spokesman that He's using today, and yet the lawyer asked him, "Do you, you know, do you believe that you are the only channel that God's using today?" And the guy's like, or he says that, "No, I think it'd be presumptuous." <laughs> I was just like, "What? Like that is not what I learned at the meetings. Like you were like on the stand, like lying, right? Like, and you're supposed to be like ruling with God in heaven. <laughs> like, doesn't say liars won't make it into the kingdom, like." What do you think about the JW two witness policy that if a child has been sexually abused, they cannot report to authorities without two eyewitnesses to the crime? I well, first of all, I had no idea until he just told me that. I didn't even know that that could be a rule in any sort of people group. Like it seems illegal. So I, I don't understand how that can be legal. That is, that's complete rubbish. Yeah, I've, I've never heard of anything like it. That's heartbreaking. Mm, I didn't know that was a thing. And that just puts the, that just points the finger to the victim. I think that just like it takes away all freedom of of the per person that was abused and just yeah just really um, so no I didn't know that. What do you think about the JW two witness policy that if a child has been sexually abused they cannot report to the authorities without two eyewitnesses to the crime? Well, yeah, it, it, to, to me that's wrong. I believe. Yeah, I, I mean legally, obviously, I think should be reported but I just think that breaks God's heart and it breaks my heart that that would be that would be an enforced thing that happens that's hard to even believe that that still happens these days anyway so it was quite quite a dark time because I I couldn't I felt like I couldn't initially tell my husband because in case I was being led away by, by Satan if I let him know it might be a cult that he wouldn't you know let me take the kids to the meeting anymore or, or and that was my first thought right and um, I couldn't tell anybody at work because there was witnesses that worked there. And uh, finally, one day, I um, told Scott about this. And um, instead of being like, you know, yes, it is a cult, you know, you should get out of it. He was like, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> like, there's two sides to every story. Don't just assume, like, 
like do some research like don't just accept it as truth like actually you know look into this like he he was the opposite of what a jehovah's witness would think a non-believer and a spouse would say like usually they'd be yeah let's get out of here like you know like so I thought that all along or whatever, but it wasn't. It was the opposite. It was like, slow down, like, let's, like, research this. So I did, to the best. Oh, man. What would have been, so this was January when I had this, or the end of December when I had this conversation with her, I would say probably by mid-February. It was, um, uh, realized that it was a high control group or, like, a cult. And, uh, it's horrifying because you've spent your whole life, um, basing everything around this group you know you don't go to university so you work you know smaller like jobs and and don't you know really build a foundation you know for yourself for retirement <laughs> or anything like that and um i had also robbed you know my husband of, of holidays with the kids like father's day and, and all those things and uh so it's, it's quite earth shattering um so then <clears throat> I'm watching all these like you know videos of you know people who are spe you know people who are have left like activists and and stuff, and stuff like that and uh, but I still believed like I, I still believed in God and um, so I was driving one day at work and um, just I don't know where that scripture in Roman, Romans chapter twelve where Paul <clears throat> says um, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses. And this just, just came into my head out of like nowhere. Like I wasn't thinking about the Bible or anything like, like specific verses and things. And, um, so I was like, why would he like be using that, um, wording, you know, for, um, these, cause I knew Hebrews 11 was about the faith, faithful men of old, like list them off. And so I was like, why would he use a wording that would indicate that they are above and aware of what the Christians were doing? in the first century. And so I came home and I pulled, I got out a legitimate Bible <laughs> and um, was reading Hebrews 11. And it's like it says in there, after it's listening to all of these faithful men of old, that their uh, hope was a, a heavenly hope and that they were alien residents here on the earth. And so I was quite horrified. Um, you know, you've <laughs> spent 37 years thinking that when people die, that they are just, you know, gone, like they're ceased to exist, but are in God's memory. And, um, so I was, I went to bed pretty upset. I was bawling about it. And, uh, so I was praying obviously, cause I still believe. And, uh, I was just like, Oh my God, is everything that I believe a lie? Like everything about you, like even death, do we not actually die? And, um, so I fell asleep and then I woke up in the middle of the night to this loud voice that said, start over, don't have an agenda. And, uh, and then I fell back to sleep. And then the next day on the way to work, this dream that I'd had in September or October about my dad and my cousin comes back into my head just out of nowhere. I wasn't even, like I'd forgotten about the dream the whole, that's whole, you know, what is this, four or five months since, right? And um, yeah, it just was, just came into my head. Like, and it makes sense. The dream makes sense when you believe in heaven now, right? And uh, so then I was doing um, I was trying to figure out who Jesus, like Jesus, right? Like it's, that's the focus of the New Testament. And, um, because I had been doing a lot of research on the history of Jehovah's Witnesses and things, um, on my suggested feed was videos entitled like, um, is Jesus Michael the Archangel? And so I would click on these videos and, um, these activists are showing from the scriptures how it's impossible that he could have been a created angel and then how the society has added the words um other in that i think it's colossians one i think um we're talking about how jesus was the firstborn of all creation that doesn't mean firstborn is in created it means like preeminent right over everything and that the organization had added the word other in various spots within those verses and uh that he's not a created thing and um <clears throat> so that was the biggest bell i think Swallowing is realizing that, you know, you've been demoting God to an angel for 37 years. Do you believe that Jehovah's Witnesses are biblical Christians? 
I, I do not believe the teachings are, would be um, in the Bible. I don't, I don't believe in the theology. I find it hard to whitewash a whole bunch of people because we've, I believe God's so big and Jesus is so amazing that in that, even in the very flawed, what I see as a flawed system um, and teachings, he can reveal himself. So as far as the teaching and the uh, leadership and the literature that comes out about it, I don't believe it's biblical. It's a tough question. No. <laughs> um, so for my beliefs, Christian, it's that you're filled with the Holy Spirit and that you are led by the Holy Spirit by Jesus. And I don't think that they they are that. I don't think they're being they have that connection with Jesus and the Holy Spirit. So I don't I answer no. I think maybe I knew that there was when I became a Christian, which was only four or five years ago, um, I think I learned or someone told me that Jehovah Witness had some sort of tie to Christianity or Jesus God in some way, but I, from what I understood it was different than the Bible and the Jesus that I knew to be true and that I had met personally. Okay, so I had um, was basically figuring out or realizing that uh, he is not an angel and never was an angel. Um, and actually, I remember the day that I realized that I was at the gym. I was walking towards the dumbbells, and it just like just snapped in my brain to realize that he is literally the Word of God manifest in the flesh. And so, for any JWs that say, "Well, that's impossible," you could say, "Well, the Bible says that all things are possible with God." This is this is God we're talking about. This is not some created like human being like us. Like it's beyond our our comprehension. And so that's what I realized is that he's literally the Word of God manifest in the flesh. And um, so basically, what I did was I compiled all the information that I was realizing and learning, and I wrote like a fifty-four page letter to my family to explain um, like where I was because I was leaving the organization, but I wasn't leaving God. Like, and, um, <laughs> I think, that's uh, the hardest part because <clears throat> and my parents worked really hard Um, you know, I think that they led a really good example on, on being loyal to, to God, you know, like <clears throat> one time my dad bought my mom tickets to Harry Belafonte because she really liked him and so they bought tickets and then it turned out that that was going to be the week the circuit over here, you know, came into town so they didn't end up going. <laughs> So, uh, so that's what's the hardest about this is that I'm exactly what they wanted, like someone who's loyal to God. Even after finding out everything you know about it's a lie. <clears throat> Sorry, get this stuff together. And um, I'm being shunned for it. <laughs> So, but at the same time, I have to remember that um, they're victims, and uh, when they snap out of it, it's quite a humble pill. There's <clears throat> ends up being a lot of a lot of apologizing to people that you've hurt. You know, like there's a lot of apologizing that I had to do to non JW family. That we, that we had that we didn't associate with because you know you limit your contact with them because for fear of you know wrecking yourself spiritually or whatever <clears throat> and uh, you know they they are quite troubled with how the family is reacting to you know us leaving and how they're basically they've they've cut contact right for even they've limited my mom has limited contact with my daughter but I don't think that she talks to my son or, you know, like the damage that they're doing to them will be 
is significant, I think, and they're going to have a lot of... But I, I also tried to convey that and remind the kids not to... Like, <sighs> they're victims, you know? They got my mom when she was young and, you know, just lost her dad and newly married and a new baby and, you know, um, she feared hell. So the idea that hell <clears throat> didn't exist was a hook, line, and sinker for her. Anyway, so... Um, so I wrote that letter, uh, and then I sent it, and I also went and disasso sent disassoci disassociation letters uh, to the elders that same day, um, because I wanted them to understand that, you know, they stole 37 years, and I was not going to let them steal anymore. <laughs> and I and I do not um, play Watchtower games. I don't um, contact family, because I am not playing into their little... You know, videos they play of where the child calls the mother and the mother has to, you know, not answer. Like, I, I'm just not going to put my mom in that, that situation. And I'm not going to be that girl. Like, <laughs> it's, it's, oh man, they've, they've done a good job on <laughs> indoctrinating parents to, you know, re react that way. Okay, so now, um, since leaving, um, I would say I, I'm, been the happiest I've ever been. You don't have the weight of um, feeling like you have to earn um, your salvation. That it's simply believing in Jesus and um, using your life to show love to others and to reach out to others and help others when you when you can. Because that's essentially what he was teaching people to do. And that um, your salvation is not about uh, earning. You don't work for your salvation. It's simply by believing. And that... Um, your good works are a result of your faith. That it, you become um, a more loving, caring, uh, nurturing person. Like you want to reach out to others and help others. And so for me, that was the biggest um, relief, I would say. Um, not feeling weighted down by having all these legalistic things that you got to do within the organization to, to maybe, maybe make it into, <laughs> you know, paradise. And um, that knowing that it just simply through like believing in Jesus and uh, working to imitate him in his life. Right? And so since leaving, um, I am attempting to change careers. I currently drive transit for the city we live in here. And I'm trying out for police. <laughs> Ironic. <laughs> I would say God has some humor there. <laughs> and uh, so I hope, I hope that works out. We're going through the phases of that. And um, I don't know, just a challenge, right? Like, And I've always really liked the, the career. Um, but you can't, obviously, as a journalist, just have a job where you are carrying a gun. And you also believe any day now the police are going to come arrest you. <laughs> Simply for being a... Jehovah's Witness, and they've really ramped up the photos of that, so. <laughs> when my family finds out. <laughs> That'll be funny. <laughs> um, did you know that Jehovah's Witnesses shun former members who don't follow their doctrines anymore, including family? Yeah, I, I did, did know that. I've heard that, and um, yeah, it's, heart, it's heartbreaking. We should be able to disagree and have some different views and still be family, so yeah. Do you know that Jehovah's Witnesses shun former members? I had no idea. I did not know that, no. What do you think about that? If they don't want to believe their doctrines, they have to be shunned in their family. Yeah, I think it's very works-based and it seems more, more of a uh, dictatorship than... Say, yeah, I don't really know what to say about that. Yeah. Um, did you know that Jehovah's Witnesses shun former members, even family, if they do not believe their doctrines anymore? Uh, no, it's rough. Uh, no, I didn't know that, and I'm sorry that that happens to to people in Canada and around the world. Yeah. <coughs> Um, 
I understand. <laughs> I understand why she's... <clears throat> not contacting me. She believes that she's... Uh, that's how she's showing me the ultimate form of love is Betty and Olivia. <laughs> so I understand. Um, and I forgive her. <sighs> she's the victim. You know, <clears throat> and so, uh, and I love her. I love her. I have to say that to all of them. You know, because they're all, they've all been hoodwinked. Right? Especially so you're, when you're born into it, like my siblings. So, <clears throat> um, they wake up to contact me because I'm because I want uh, contact. So I wait every day, <laughs> and I I know it, it'll happen eventually. And then it seems like more and more people are waking up all the time, so I'm just gonna have to wait it out. Right, but like I said earlier, I'm not gonna play Watchtower games and, and reach out to them and, and play into their little, you know, fear mongering that the organization is doing. Just not that, that type of person. <laughs> stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> but stubborn in a good way in this case, you know, because, yeah, I don't know. I just hope it happens. I hope it happens soon. Yeah. Um. So. Um, in 2005, when I got baptized, I went back home for a family reunion, and um, in the basement in the King Hall is where they collect all the old books for people who died, and they did, you know, to put them there, and you can take from them if you want them. So I went and I collected um, Watchtowers back to the 1970, but I actually happened to have the Awake 1969 in here as well, and uh, it's evidence <laughs> that I keep. <laughs> Um, and it has an article entitled, What Future for the Young Ones? And it says, Young or old, you need to face up to the fact that this system is not going to change its direction. Under Satan's influence, it will continue to deteriorate rapidly in its remaining years. It says, If you are a young person, you also need to face the fact that you will never grow old in this present system of things. Why not? Because all the evidence in fulfillment of Bible prophecy indicates that this corrupt system is due to end in a few years. Of the generation that observed the beginning of the last days in 1914, Jesus foretold, this generation will by no means pass away until all these things occur. Therefore, as a young person, you will never fulfill a career that this system offers in 1969. So if you were what, like 15 at the time, You'd be, what, almost in your late 60s? Retirement. And now have no retirement. <laughs> so, you know, to discourage higher education for people and leave people destitute in their older years or just struggling, you know, is disgusting. To, to take advantage of people in their young, their young years and uh, use it to peddle your books and to peddle your website, to peddle your lies is disgusting. And so, wake up. <laughs>